Chapter 24, Part 2, The New World Balance, 1850-1900. So again, it's an important era in history worldwide as we approach the 20th century. Uh, the next section in the book, our chapter, I should say, is Nationalism and the Rise of Italy, Germany, and Japan. How was nationalism transformed from a revolutionary to a conservative ideology? So, so nationalism is an interesting kind of word. I think people think it's the same thing as being patriotic. And it, it is on, on some level, but it, it's really taking patriotism a little bit too far. So here you see the, the example, you know, they're, 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 they're marching in, in place following the leader. He's going off a cliff. So you kind of have to be aware of where your leader's leading you before you jump in and follow. OK, that's the idea, kind of kind of blind faith in whatever your country says. So according to your book, it's a, it's a long um, uh, definition, I apologize. Uh, it is a political philosophy that stresses people's membership in a nation, a community defined by a common culture and history as well as by territory. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, nationalism was a force for unity in Western Europe. This is an important aspect of this chapter in the, in the, the coming 20th century and the coming world wars. In the late 19th century, it hastened the disintegration of the Austro-Hungarian and Ottoman empires. In the 20th century, it provided the ideological foundation for scores of independent countries emerging from colonialism. So again, you've, you've been, you're downtrodden, you've been oppressed, you've been under somebody's thumb. So nationalism kind of kind of gives you a lift as a people coming, you know, becoming in, independent and, and being on your own again. Uh, here's a shorter definition that perhaps is more to the point. Nationalism is the identification with one's own nation and support for its interests, especially to the exclusion or detriment of the interests of other nations. So again, it, it's it's a bit of a negative. To, to, to call somebody nationalist, you're saying that you have a blind faith and will do whatever your country tells you to do no matter what. So exclusion or detriment of the interests of other nations. You don't care about them, you just care about you. Okay. Uh, so, so nationalism seems to be categorized by language and boundaries of, you know, empires and countries many times have to do with language. That, that's not unusual in history. Language is typically unique to a specific group. And we don't like to mix always with people that don't speak the same language and, and become their, you know, or, or welcome them into our, into our country. Let's become one big country. Not typically, okay? Uh, another important topic in this era is the word liberalism. So understand that liberalism was a direct result of democracy and individual freedoms, you know, free votes, all, all these things that are happening, we've talked about as that era came. The age of revolution spawned democracies and freedoms and liberty and equality. Well, we hope so anyway, allegedly, right? Um, so liberalism is connected to, to the idea of nationalism because the people were speaking out. Uh, no more oppression, no more abuse, discrimination based on social class. You know, we've had it. We don't want any more. Uh, so according to your book, liberalism is a political ideology that emphasizes the civil rights of citizens, representative government, and the protection of private property. This ideology derived from the Enlightenment was especially popular among the property-owning middle class of Europe and North America. Okay, this chapter is also about unification. Unification means to come together. So in this case, different countries that have a bond or a shared allegiance, you know, come together in unity, solidarity, you gain strength in numbers. Uh, we'll talk about Italy first here. So here you see the what happens with unification. On the left, you see a country that's got a lot of countries, a lot of different areas, and they're all perhaps have their own politics and government and points of view, ideology, and, and so on. Uh, when you unify, they all come together on the right as one country. So that's bringing everybody together, okay? In Italy, a group was, was led by Giuseppe Garibaldi who was an ardent revolutionary. Uh, he conquered the area known as the Two Sicilies in Italy. So who was Giuseppe Garibaldi, according to your book? An Italian nationalist, there's that word, and revolutionary, we talked about that at length also, who conquered Sicily and Naples and added them to a unified Italy in 1860. So 
So Italy is unified. Germany comes next. Okay. Uh, German unification. German, Germany was the last major Europe, European power to unify. In fact, they were divided up into 39 independent states before they came together. And here you see the map is kind of a mess. Uh, the largest state that was part of Germany is Prussia. Okay. Uh, uh, so a man named Otto von Bismarck uh, used the Prussian, not Russian, Prussian. And we'll talk about the difference here in a minute. Uh, he used the Prussian military backed by a fervent German nationalism. And he defeated Austria. And then he defeated France. And that allows them to unify. So who was Otto von Bismarck? He was the Chancellor or Prime Minister of Prussia from 1862 until 1871 when he became Chancellor of Germany. A conservative nationalist, he led Prussia to victory against Austria in 1866 and then France 1870, as I said previously, and was responsible for the creation of a German empire in 1871. Okay, so, so what is Prussia? So you look at the images here. Um, this, this is along what what is known as well uh, along the Baltic Sea. So it's kind of it's kind of present day Germany today, but but in, in, including some some other places. Mo mostly Prussia became Germany, and and you see here the 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 isthmus here is right here. So it's all all this kind of space right here is over here. So Prussia unified with Germany, and then it became Germany. Okay. Okay, let's watch a crash course film here regarding the unification of both these countries. Please watch the film entitled Italian and German Unification, and then come on back. Okay, so we talked about uh, Japan. We talked about the Treaty of Kanagawa and how that led to their industrialization. Uh, this is also known as the Meiji Restoration, or Meiji, it could be pronounced also. Uh, so what was the Meiji Restoration? It was the political program that followed the destruction of the Tokugawa Shogunate, we talked at length about them, in 1868, in which a collection of young leaders set Japan on the path of centralization, industrialization, and imperialism. So again, this is when they decide, let's, let's go ahead and join in on this industrial, industrialization idea and, and open our country not entirely, at least at first, but maybe maybe we should be part of this, okay? Uh, <clears throat> uh, what's interesting about these these three these three countries that I've just talked about, Italy, Germany, and Japan, while Germany and Italy are somewhat near each other, you know, Japan's on the other side of Asia from from the other two. But uh, by by the time of World War II, the three of these countries will become the Axis powers. And be the countries and the force that f will fight the British, France, French, and the United States in World War II. So all three of these countries I've just talked about will become America's enemy in World War II. Germany uh, and Italy in World War One also. Okay. Uh, so they begin their rise here, and and uh, you know and they they become the Axis powers. Okay. Um, Okay, the next section in our book is called The Great Powers of Europe, 1871 to 1900. How did the forces of nationalism affect the main, major, sorry, powers of Europe? Okay, so, so the important thing to, to take from this section, and, and truly the last couple of chapters, is the impact of the Industrial Revolution. This is all about that. Everything we're talking about had to do with this Industrial Revolution, how it changed the world. Mass production, factories. You know, and, and we know there's huge positives from this, but also negatives. And we've covered this all at, at length. Uh, so industrialization, mechanization, the rise of science, all this led to modern weaponry also, okay? Uh, new ways to kill lots of people, not just some, like lots of people. And we'll see this in the World War era, World War One and Two. Uh, so with that kind of weaponry and that kind of uh, science and, and technology and, and all of that, it leads to imperialism for more profits. 
uh, led to intense competition in Europe that ultimately would lead to war. Uh, tragic, shameful war, two wars. So industrializing countries also militarized and they built huge armies and navies. Uh, so again, this will all come to a head in the shocking era of World War I and II. So if you look at the map here, this, this is, this is post-unification, okay? So you see that in the, in the main body of, of Europe itself, you got Great Britain, you got France, Germany, Italy, Austria, Hungary, Russia, Spain. Uh, and not to suggest that nobody else is relevant, but those were the main players in, in this kind of uh, struggle for power. Uh, as we get there, we'll, we'll learn about what happens as an assassination, and that leads to kind of a power vacuum, and people are struggling for, for you know, uh, to, to, to get ahead of everybody else. I also failed to mention the Ottoman Empire. So all, all these major empires are all right here, like a log jam ready to burst and, and have a have a war okay uh so how are these how and why were these empires separated why didn't someone just make it all one big empire like you know caesar did way back uh, well i mentioned that it was language that, that categorized countries and empires and that really is what what creates boundaries but also religion religion's always a you know, a factor in, in nearly every aspect of human history. Let's go to our next film here. This will take a look at this idea and explain what created these boundaries between empires. Uh, so the history of empires is not always just about their military, okay, or militaries. Uh, this film is a unique look at where and who these empires were. Uh, please watch the film entitled Empires Before World War I Khan Academy. And then come on back. Okay, so diplomacy is also part of this of this era. Uh, diplomacy is what it had become about, because if you didn't have that, you'd have maybe just you know uh, a bloodletting. It, it, no, nobody would stop anybody. So what is what does diplomacy mean? It is the established method of influencing the decisions and behavior of foreign governments and peoples through dialogue, negotiation, and other measures short of war or violence. It is the art and practice of conducting negotiations between nations and skill in handling affairs without arousing hostility. So you you know you you send ambassadors to a country. They they live in the in the embassy in a country, and they're there to have a presence and try to keep the peace. And ambassadors are constantly negotiating and talking to different ways to, to try to, you know, through dialogue, negotiation, short of war. You're trying to stay away from war. That's, that's what diplomacy is. And it truly is all based on the international relations of these great powers in the 19th century as they approach again the 20th century. And as I said many times, the negative direction it'll take as it all devolves into two world wars in a 30-year period, killing numbers of people that had never been seen before. So modern technology, it certainly worked because in a, in a, in a world, you know, 100 years prior to this where, you know, a couple thousand people might, men might die in a large battle, as you'll see in World War II, it's not thousands, it's millions, okay? Uh, modern technology will change the face of warfare. Uh, so the air recovery in this in this chapter is is the period between the the end of the Napoleonic Wars. We remember Napoleon Bonaparte and his battles with the British, and all the way to the start of the First World War. Uh, important themes in this chapter include the rapid industrialization and growing power of countries like Great Britain. United States, France, Prussia, Germany, uh, and later in the period, Italy and Japan will join them. Um, all this led to imperialist and colonialist competitions for influence and power throughout the world. That's what it's all about. It's about power. If you have power and you have the military might to back it up or, or create it, and you have the the uh, you know ways and means to do it. You're going to gain for yourself. So again, history can be very selfish, also. Uh, 
So about, it's about power. We talked about the, the, the famous scramble for Africa in the 1880s and 1890s. That's a scramble for power. Uh, scramble for Africa, scramble for power. It's all about get those, get those lands, get those goods so we can trade and make money and become a power. <clears throat> we talked about the scramble for Africa in our last chapter. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the after effects of all of this, even though it happened more than 100 years ago, are still widespread and still consequential in the 21st century. It still has an effect on us today. Now, more so in Europe than the United States, but even so, we still have an effect from all, all that happened back in those days. History is connected. You know, history doesn't end and start a new era. History connects all the way back to the, to the first caveman. Uh, that's probably like not a very nice description of an of a, uh, ancient person, but you, you get my idea anyway. Okay, um, but after saying all that, the 19th century was largely a, a peaceful century. There, there were no real wars between the great powers, with the exception of the, of the time between 1854 and 1871, and the wars between Russia and the Ottoman Empire that we talked about. Besides that, considering all these countries are jockeying for power and strength, there weren't that many wars. Uh, but that will change as the 20th century turns and, and, and 19, you know, 1900s began. Uh, after 1900, there, there were a series of wars in the Balkan region. Okay, so looking at the map, uh, the Balkans in 1914, you see it's different than what it looks like today. Uh, today, it's kind of become a whole lot of small countries again. And we hear about these countries today, Bosnia, uh, Herzegovina. Uh, Kosovo, Serbia, Croatia, uh, and so on. Um, that's who they are today. But in 1914, more than 100 years ago, this is what it looked like. And it was mostly Austria-Hungary. And they'll be the kind of instigators of, uh, well, I, I'm sorry, an event that happens to them will be will instigate this war. But you see the, Auto the Ottoman Empire is down here. And you got all these power players. You got Russia, you got you got, you know, Italy, uh, France, and, and Great Britain are up here. They're all kind of there, ready to explode, okay? Uh, so what's the Balkan region, also known as the Balkans? The Balkans are a cluster of nations in Eastern Europe. They lay between the Ottoman and Austro-Hungarian empires, and the, and the map clearly shows that, okay? Uh, okay, uh, so, so they are... The, the Balkans are considered as one of the causes of the of the First World War because they were strategically placed between these two empires. Uh, anybody that could get that land, it would help them help their nations achieve uh, invincibility. Uh, this region was also politically unstable as there were different ethnicities. So that you know that, that always causes problems. Uh, in, in human uh, interaction. Uh, there was also a rising nationalism in, in the region uh, that also brought about tensions, creating friction uh, amongst themselves, even, even between, even in a, you know, a, a country that's all the same. So lot, lots of friction and paranoia and, you know, all this kind of stuff is happening. Um, Let's go to our next film. Please watch the film entitled Tinderbox, and that's a great uh, description of Europe. Tinderbox Europe from Balkan Troubles to World War I. Go ahead and watch that film, and then come on back. And like I said a couple times, this would ex explode out of control into World War I, 1914, 1918. A massively devastating event that was completely unexpected. So I may mentioned before, I'm sure I did, you know, it really was an era of reform. We talked about the progressive movement. We'll probably get to that later on in this class. Uh, the progressive movement was a was a, a, a era of reform. Reform means to make things better. We talked about why the the uh, you know abuses of the industrial revolution, the the long hours, the child labor, and and all, and all of that, the living in tenements and and the dangerous cities and so reform movements come along progressive and try to make it better for people um so while that's going on boom out of nowhere comes this 
this this you know very bleak era. This World, World War One was one of the most bleak eras in human history. It just didn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, so it was unexpected in its timing, duration, casualties, and long-term impact. Okay, um, let's see. Let's go to our next section here. And this is entitled China, Japan, and the Western Powers. And the question asked is, how did the Western, how did Western pressure affect East Asia? Okay, let's go right to a film here. Let's go to our next film. Please watch the film entitled The Era of Modernization in Japan. We'll kind of give you a background of, you know, we talked about the Treaty of Kanagawa and how that kind of kicked it off. So go ahead and watch that film and then come on back. Okay, let's do a supplemental lecture right here, and this will be number 11, and we'll call this, Is There a Silver Lining to All of This? So where is he going with that? What does that mean? Well, stay with me. Um, okay, let's, let's go to our outline. Is there a silver lining to all of this? Introduction, what is a silver lining? Number two, Chinese philosophy, yin and yang. Dualism. So give me a little bit of background about what each of those are. Uh, negatives in our class. We've, we've talked a lot about the negatives in, in, in modern world history. It's not always, in, in, in fact, mostly that's what it is. Uh, so elaborate on that, and I'll, I'll give you some examples. Number four, inject philosophy. So you'll understand what that means when you get there. Well, I hope so anyway. Number five, Japan. So what was... Japan's dilemma and then what was their silver lining so understand where we're going here I'm trying to you know in, inject this idea as as a positive Shana what was their dilemma and what was their silver lining uh, number seven is positivity elaborate on that <clears throat> and number eight is the relevance as always okay all right so let's go ahead and, and get started here. So a silver lining. I'm sure you've heard the, uh, the phrase before. Every cloud has a silver lining. So what does that mean? It, it means that you look at the picture there. It's a stormy day, but the sun somehow shines through. That's the silver lining. Um, there's, 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 there's always good in the bad. Problems can sometime, sometimes help us learn new things. That's kind of the point of this lecture. It's it's kind of a it's kind of a look at philosophy about life, but it's also how we can use that in a historical setting. Also, okay. Uh, so looking for the good in the bad is what what we're talking about here. So suggesting that everything has a silver lining is a sign of hope in an unfortunate or gloomy situation. Uh, you get in a car accident, your car's, you know, busted up, and you're saying, well, you know, there's there's got to be a silver lining somewhere, and you, and you look for that, okay? A silver lining is finding a bright prospect that is inside of a negative, okay? So you want to find the good. It's in there somewhere. You want to find the positive. It's in there somewhere. Uh, okay, so... Uh, uh, every cloud is a silver lining. What does that mean? In every bad situation, there is an element of good. That's the point. Um, so, for example, let's say you're a parent and you have a daughter and she's playing volleyball in her school and uh, you're going to, she has a match on, you know, the next couple, in a day or two that she has a match, but you have to go on a business trip. Because you got your degree and you got a really high paying job and you're a manager and you got to go and, and learn something from somebody else. You got to you, you, you got to go and placate one of your customers. You, you can't say no to your job. I mean, you got to keep your job, right? So you have to say no to your daughter. Of course, she's upset, but understands you're upset. But what can you do? You, you got to put food on the table. You're the breadwinner. But then your trip is canceled. Wow. OK, now I can go to the match. So every cloud is a silver lining. Uh, you know, if you look for it, you'll find it. And here it is. That's the idea behind what a silver lining is. Okay. So 
taking that a step further, uh, if there's a silver lining to losing my job, it's that I'll now be able to go to school full time and finish my degree earlier. Now, I've kind of experienced that, to be perfectly honest, um, older in life than most of you. But um, I was in business all my life and I was kind of at a place where I was kind of, you know, um, trying to get out of, of the business I was in. And I just wanted to go in a different direction. And it, it scared me. I, I wasn't sure, like, you know, are, are you nuts? You know, I, I, I did fairly well in business and, and managed to raise a family and buy a home and all those kind of things. But I wanted to go in a different direction and become a, a teacher and, and, and get my I wanted to, you know, get my degree and get a master's degree and teach in community college, to be perfectly honest. It was scary, but I did it. And and that's what happened. I, I found the opportunity. Uh, my business kind of, you know, running out of steam. And it wasn't just that. It was just I wanted to move on. That's a negative. But I spun it into a positive, and here I am. Um, whether this is a good thing or, 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 or not it is open for debate. Maybe not all of you would see it at, uh, becoming a teacher as a positive, but for me it was. You know, I, I wanted to do that. This is what I wanted to do. And I did it later in life, and so I found my silver lining. Okay. Uh, so a lot of this has to do with Chinese philosophy. Right? That's what we're really talking about, yin and yang. So what is yin and yang? I mean, we see it a lot. It's a very popular tattoo. Um, you see a lot of a lot of these out there. So um, it, it's about opposites. That, that's what yin and yang is really about. It's about opposites. It's about understanding that you have to have both in your life to have a balanced and centered life. You can't have a life to expect just happiness or just positivity. Uh, you can't do that because that's not that's not reality. So to have a balanced and centered life, according to Chinese philosophy and the yin and the yang, is to learn how to manage the opposites. So positives and negatives. Learn how to do deal with both of those. But it's also sun and moon, light and dark. And we have those moments where you feel light, you feel dark. You have to understand that dark will come in your life also. So just embrace it and deal with it. And, and that will give you a centered life. Heaven and earth, <clears throat> active, passive, fire, water, above, below, heat, cold, generation, growth, wake, sleep. Now, you could also say evil and good. Um, the problem with saying that is that people tend to think it's just about that, and it's not. Evil and good are, are opposites also, but all of these are, are part of, of the life process, okay? So... Um, you know this. This is what this is what Chinese philosophy is about: is learning to manage the, manage this. Okay, in ancient Chinese philosophy, yin and yang is the concept of what's called dualism, uh, and we'll talk about what dualism is here in a minute. Uh, describing how obviously opposite or contrary forces may actually be complementary. So, okay, um, opposite forces like light and dark. Uh, moon and earth, evil and good, may be complementary. That's the point of, of yin and yang. They're interconnected and interdependent in the natural world. You can't, you can't escape them. And how they may give rise to each other as they interrelate to one another. Okay. So dualism. Um, this is a, a little bit of a, of a different, uh, I mean, it's, it's in the same, it's part of yin and yang, but it's a little bit different also. So, so what is dualism? It mean, mean that there's two, right? Dual means, means two. Uh, so dualism is a religious principle that the universe contains opposed powers of good and evil, especially seen as balanced equals. So in this, in this quote, they use good and evil. But again, I want to be, I want to stress to you that it's not just about good or evil. You know, heaven and hell, it's not just about that. It's about opposites. This just happens to be one of them. Uh, dualism is also the concept that our mind is more than just our brain. What does that mean? It, it implies that our mind has a non-material spiritual dimension that includes consciousness and possibly even an immortal power. Wow, that's pretty deep. Um, okay, so, so the, I'm going to ask you a question. Is it true that every negative experience in life is actually a positive one in disguise? Has he gone nuts? 
Now, just hear me out. This is something I've learned in my own life also. You know, I, I now understand that tragicness may not work here. You know, if you if you have a situation where you lose somebody tragically, you know, a young person or, a, you know, a, a tragic death or some, maybe not. Although I bet in your life at some point you may look back and say, you know, after you learn how to manage something like that, that you said, you'll say, as awful as that was, I learned this because of that, okay? But I've, I've learned this myself. I, this is how I try to live. When when you, when you when your car breaks down, you know, you want to, you're angry. You know, when your girlfriend or boyfriend breaks up with you, you're hurt. When, when, you, when you lose your job, you know, you like that job. And maybe you had a future there, but now they've let you go. And, of course, we're always hurt. But if you can learn to say, okay, this is not good, but there's a positive in there for me to learn, I've got to find the positive. It's a, a negative experience is actually a positive one in disguise. Find the positive, okay? So so you, if your boyfriend or girlfriend breaks up with you, it's going to hurt. You're going to feel down. You're going to feel useless. But then along comes somebody else. They, wow, this, this person's way better than, than the last person. I'm much more suited to them. Than it was to the to the old person, okay, or your job. You know, you you might find that because you got laid off, you're looking for a job that you wouldn't have been doing if you didn't get laid off, and and along comes a a much more interesting job that you fit into, like a glove, and and you t you interview, you get the job, and you're off and running. So three months later, when you look back, I you know I got I got laid off. That was awful, but but wait. The silver lining is I got a new job and it's it's a, it's a much better job than I had, even though I like that job. So where am I going with all this? This this is not a philosophy class. <laughs> this is a history class. So where am I going with all this? Um, what am I what am I trying to? Um, what is my point here? Has he lost his mind? Uh, well, I I got to be honest. I, I love philosophy. I, I would be just as happy being a philosophy professor as a history professor. Uh, I have found in my own life, and take it for what it's worth, we can find answers, the answers to what, what troubles us in our lives by studying philosophy. I've done it. It's, it's a good thing. I would, I would recommend it to anybody. Uh, it's definitely a passion of mine. But let's get back to, to history here before I lose my job. Okay. <laughs> But, but wait a minute, if I lose my job, if that did happen, doesn't that mean that the silver lining that I would find in that event would result in finding a better job? So maybe I should lose my job. Okay, I'm getting, I'm getting way out, out left field here. We're getting way too esoteric here. And besides, there's no better job in the world for me than, than mine, okay? Okay, so we have talked a lot about the negative things in history in this class. A lot of things colonialism, imperialism. These are awful things for the people that it's being subjected on, right? Uh, racism, discrimination. And we've talked, you know, at, at length about this, and we all, we all feel this every day uh, in, our, in our present day society. And there's lots more. Ethnocentrism, conquests, genocide, slavery, indentures, exploitation, dehumaniz dehumanization, the abuse of women all through history. Uh, all of these leave scars and, and degradation in, in its wake. Uh, so the question I'm asking in, in, this, in this kind of uh, outer space uh, supplemental lecture, can, can we take these ideas of philosophy uh, that was begun by humans and use the same concepts in history? Uh, can, can we inject philosophy into a situation like this? So, so again, hist I mean, people are one thing, philosophy for people, but can we, can we inject the same tenets, the same ideas of philosophy into politics and military and world powers? I mean, can, can we do that? Uh, can countries use these same ideas and spin a silver lining out of their dilemmas, their negatives? Does, does, does yin and yang apply to people or can we only or can we apply to a larger entity such as an empire or a country? So is there a silver lining in all of this for, 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 those, for those countries? 
So let's look at two examples here that hopefully will prove the point that yes, we can do that. Okay. So we've talked about Japan, uh, you know, at, at length, and um, we talked about the Treaty of Kanagawa a couple times. I keep on coming back to it because it's important to me. This is this is an incident that that seems to stick with me as a as a great moment to illustrate a lot of things. But we remember gunboat diplomacy. The United States showed up in the harbor of Japan after Japan said, no, we don't want to trade with you. We don't want to be westernized. We want you to stay away from us. The United States said, we, we, we can't, we, we need this. We, we need this business. We want your stuff. We're going to get rich. So you see in the image that the, the gunboats out there pointing their cannons at the, at Japan sign or else. Okay. And we talked about treaty ports, you know, where, where Japan allowed the, the United States and European countries to trade only at different ports. Talked about extraterritoriality, where these people come in and kind of do what they want because they're, they're not uh, subject to Japanese laws, and they were angry, humiliated by this. Okay, they, they didn't they didn't like this. Uh, you know, to to be forced at the point of a gun, you know, menacing them, intimidating them from their own harbor. Uh, but as I've said before, they spun it into a positive because the this incident ultimately led them to modernize Japan. And this, this resulted uh, in them becoming a world power in our, into our modern day. What would have happened if they would have held on to remaining isolationists? They would have been left behind on the international stage. What happens to countries that are left behind that don't industrialize? They get crushed. So Japan might have been crushed and not even relevant today if they hadn't modernized. Uh, so understand, it, it wasn't a good thing that happened to them. I'm not saying it was good that the United States, you know, threatened them. I, I don't mean that at all. What I'm saying is that's a negative, but Japan spun it into a positive. That's finding a silver lining, okay? Our next example would, will be China. Uh, so Chinese people, history, they didn't experience exploitation like the continent of Africa did or or indigenous genocides like the Native Americans in the North and South America did. But they had their own history of a communist revolution up in the, in the 20th century. This resulted in widespread suffering uh, where the communist government decided to, to start a program. It was an economic and social campaign called the uh, Great Leap Forward. But it didn't work. And the effect was, the result was, millions of Chinese starved to death in what is thought to be the largest famine in human history. Imagine that. Millions. Okay, the government's trying to do something, and the result is millions die. According to government statistics, there were 15 million excess deaths between 1959 and 1962. Excess deaths? <laughs> what does that mean? It, it, it means that they were deaths that probably shouldn't have and wouldn't have happened if they hadn't done this program. So this, this crippled uh, uh, China uh, tremendously. Uh, so the whole thing backfired and people suffered in a huge way. Uh, this is not imperialism or national or colonialism. This is in-house. This created a substantial uphill battle to regain their economic footing. Uh, so in, in China, Typically, you know, almost everything today, and even on their way up here, can be judged in terms of economic development. They looked at Japan, who had been rebuilt after World War II, under the guidance and assistance of the United States of America, because America defeated them, and then America helped them rebuild. So in the process, Japan got westernized because the United States was, was doing the rebuilding. By the 1980s and 1990s, Japan was thriving, while China looked on with confusion and envy. Uh, so, you know, perhaps China looked with envy to its neighbors who had received aid and guidance, guidance from Western nations during the Cold War. There were others, not them, because they didn't have the same history. Uh, perhaps in the context of economic and social failures during that same period, Chinese people wished that they had received some more Western influence themselves. Uh, and even now, today, Chinese, China's path of development and its rise to the world stage have been coupled with westernization. For example, take Hong Kong. Today, the only city in China to have received a lot of western influence and development in recent history. Today, it's one of the cleanest, most successful cities in Asia. People flock to visit, to live there, to reap the benefits of its western influence. Take Taiwan. 
which had also come under America's wing after the Second World War. So again, they were westernized. Many see Taiwan today as a more democratic, cleaner, more evenly developed version of China. So am I suggesting that westernization is what this is all about? Am I condoning that? No, I'm not doing that at all. Much of it was shameful and hurtful. Um, westernization was the last thing that either of these countries wanted. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about here is positivity, uh, whether it's a person or a country or an empire. Find the positive. It's there somewhere. Find the silver lining and then work on it because it will require effort. It doesn't just get easy. Oh, there it is. I'm done. No, you got to find the silver lining and then make it work for you, whether you're a person or a country. China and Japan both did this and they prospered as countries as a result. Okay, so the relevance to end the lecture, whether it's whether it is a person or a country, Chinese philosophy can be used to find and identify the positive out of a negative. One more time. Whether it is a person or a country, Chinese philosophy can be used to find and identify the positives out of a negative. Okay, that is the end of that supplemental lecture number 11. Is there a silver lining to any of this? And that is also the end of chapter 24. Thank you.